This is not just placebo effect, something you do on the weekend for fun. This is mind-body medicine. You're actually making real neurophysiological changes uh, uh, throughout your body when you do these practices. It is truly a biological practice. It's a mental practice. It's a focus of attention. There are very few things in modern society that the general public has to cope with stress. There are no practices. We are not taught in modern society how to cope with stress, how to cope with emotions. We don't have these techniques in our society. It do they don't exist. And so as a consequence, people suffer from chronic stress. And chronic stress leads to all of these lifestyle disorders and ultimately to mental health problems like depression and anxiety. And so the only way to cope with this is to have some kind of intervention that helps us cope. So I see that it is inevitable. Modern medicine, unfortunately, is focused on treating symptoms. It's not focused on treating the underlying conditions. Um, so much of biomedical research is, find, is trying to find the magic pill that will fix obesity, the magic pill that will fix type 2 diabetes, the magic pill that will fix depression. It is a dream that will never come true. You cannot treat an avalanche of lifestyle disease with pills. It's not possible. You have to treat the underlying cause of these disorders. And modern medicine is not a health care system. Modern medicine is a disease care system. You see the doctor when you are sick. We have a body. The body is connected to the mind intimately. That's really the, the, the core principle behind what we call mind-body medicine. But you can't tear these two apart. Modern medicine has done that effectively. They've got their physical doctors, I, I treat the body, and they've got their psychiatrist, I treat the mind. And they ignore each other. The psychiatrist is not willing to acknowledge that the body has anything to do with mental disorders. And, and by and large, uh, physicians working on physical medicine are largely ignorant of, of the potential impact of, of mental state on the body. And yet these things are absolutely intimately linked. And there's lots of evidence that that's the case. And yet when therapy is initiated, it's either just physical or it's just mental. So for example, for PTSD, it's talk therapy. It's all cognitive therapy. Even the meditation um, interventions are all focused on cognitive therapy. They ignore the body entirely. For the treatment of diabetes, it's considered blood sugar. So it's pills. It's, you know, diet. It's pills. But we know that both PTSD and diabetes have very strong both physical and psychological components. So the virtue of yoga is addressing both of those. Addressing the body through regulation of the breath, and through the physical postures, the physical body, and then the meditative component, the development of concentrative and focused mind and control of attention. So the physical and the breathing components are actually facilitating the central process, which is the meditative process. And the meditative process is not just a cognitive technique. You're actually changing brain function. And when you change brain function, you change brain physiology, you change, phys you change brain anatomy. Literally, the brain is plastic. So the, the, as you do different tasks uh, uh, mentally, the brain will actually change in that direction. So, you know, this, is, this ends up being, being very profound, uh, even though many people think, well, it's just, a, it's just a mental game, but it's actually changing brain structure and function. There's two uh, techniques that are really leading us to, to profound advances in the field. One of these is neuroimaging, uh, especially fMRI and these kinds of brain imaging techniques. Now, for those of us who've been practicing yoga, this is like, duh. Uh, of course it changes our brain activity. We experience changes. But to be able to image this and do it uh, objectively is really what is carrying us forward in terms of representing this to modern science and modern medicine. It's not only brain uh, activity that's changing, the brain is plastic. In other words, it exhibits plasticity, it can change its structure. So as you practice these mind-body practices, and yoga in particular, you change brain structure. You are developing a yogic brain, which essentially has better capabilities um, than uh, people who don't practice. 
Another study uh, looking at a different aspect is a study looking at fluid intelligence, a high level brain executive activity that really makes us what we are as human beings. The ability to abs think abstractly, reason, identify patterns, solve problems, and discern relationships. Meditation isn't what you think. And of course, this is exactly what meditation is. You're either focusing your attention, and in meditation you focus your attention on a target, that target can be a single point, a closed focus, call, uh, so-called meditation. Uh, you're focusing on the breath or a mantra or a word or a sound or a, a visual object. Or you can be focusing your attention on the flow of sensation or the flow of thought uh, or even the flow of, of motion of your body. In either case, you're focusing your attention. When you're not focusing your attention, what happens is your mind is wandering. And we're all familiar with mind wandering. It's what we do when we sit in the doctor's office or stand at the bus stop. And so interesting, not, not only are we studying what meditation does, we're actually starting to study what mind wandering does and is. So this is a study that was conducted uh, at Harvard um, and published in our premier biomedical journal, Science. And what they concluded from this study of mind wandering is that people's minds wandered frequently regardless of what they were doing. People were less happy when their minds were wandering than when they were not. So the conclusion was the ability to think about what is not happening is a cognitive achievement that comes at an emotional cost. And when you think about this, well, why would mind wandering be sort of negative in tone? Why would that be negative in terms of the content of emotion? Well, if you think about it a little bit, um, we are, as human beings, dependent upon, and uh, as the, the top line of the species on the planet, we're dependent upon our executive cortex, our ability to, to think abstractly, to analyze the past, to predict the future. And of course, what we're doing when we're mind wandering is basically survival regulated. Uh, we're analyzing that fight we had with our spouse this morning when we're standing at the bus stop. You're wondering, is that bus going to make it on time? If it doesn't, where's a taxi? If, that, if I'm late from work, my boss is going to chew me out. Uh, I may lose my job. i got to maybe find another job and so on and so forth. And when you look at the content of that, it's mostly negative in tone. Each one of those little things is generating an emotion response and a stress response. And if you do that 24-7, you can imagine that brain activity and brain plasticity is all going to work in developing a very strong emotional responsiveness. And what you do when you meditate is you go into a neutral space, you go into the neutral mind, you focus your attention, and mind wandering stops. So it's essentially a mind wandering holiday. And so research is now starting to show that the more people meditate, the less at risk they are for psychological mood disturbances and in fact psychological disorders. Um, and so uh, this, is, this is an interesting area because it's really starting to highlight what it means to, to focus attention in the act of meditation. Um, and in fact, in long-term meditators, you can actually see that the amygdala, the uh, limbic system, actually gets smaller. So structurally, uh, you have essentially a meditator's brain. You are less reactive to stress and emotions as you practice meditation or, or yoga over the long term. Another area which is at the cutting edge of research is molecular biological approaches, particularly genomic expression. These practices make changes in gene expression. You can, of course, not change your DNA, but you can change which genes are active and which genes are downregulated. Um, and so these studies are starting to show that we activate genes that are good for us, like reducing stress activation, um, and enhancing genes that are good for us, like uh, improving immune function. So um, not only is, um, are these yoga and meditation practices changing our central nervous system activity, they're working at the cellular level across the body. Uh, to make improvements in, in, in human functioning. Another uh, molecular piece of evidence is telomerase, uh, which is a, an enzyme that heals the ends of the, t uh, the chromosomes called the telomeres. And these telomeres uh, deteriorate with chronic stress. And so Dr. Levetsky's scheme and a few other people have shown that in fact these practices can actually increase telomerase, which is healing these ends of these chromosomes, which is a very positive uh, outcome. Uh, and again, all of this is working at the me molecular level. So again, more objective evidence showing that this is not just a hobby, this is not just placebo effect, something you do on the weekend for fun. This is mind-body medicine. You're actually making real neurophysiological changes uh, uh, throughout your body when you do these practices.